Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of the Bay Lab Podcast. I can see by the title, this is a compilation episode of looking at some of the best lessons we could derive from recent episodes. And those lessons spun the whole nature of entrepreneurship, from looking at IPO, all the way to building better bridges as a founder. My name is Amin Hussain, I'm part of the Bay HQ team, and this episode is powered by HSBC Innovation Banking. Hope you enjoy. What are some good things to be thinking about here? So what types of ethical codes or like concerns that people might not realize that they should be thinking about? So what areas should they be looking into here? <laughs> this, is a, this is a topic that I love to talk about. And it's actually something that we that we do as part of our program as well, which is a sort of session events with impact risk and the unintended consequences. And we take it a bit back to sort of the ethics and the philosophy be, be, behind technologies as well. And the sort of, the first sort of principle that we usually come back to um, is by a chap called Melvin Kranzberg, who wrote up the rules of technology. And one of the most pivotal ones that really accentuates why this is important is all about focusing that technology is neither good and nor bad, and it's definitely not neutral. Um, and it basically it basically relates to the sort of fallacy that technology is just a tool. Um, but technology is actually neither produced or used in a social vacuum. And it's it's therefore also no less neutral than the people or society that actually produce and use it. So actually being acutely aware of sort of who gets to build and who gets to decide how to distribute technologies as well is an important factor in the sort of um, entire sort of supply chain of how you distribute your tech products and services essentially and if we look at sort of tech ethics and codes we used to um we used to bring up quite a lot of tech ethics and principles through the tech for good community so there's there's quite a large proportion um i think 10 principles or so that we've um also published on our website many, many years ago, um, that sort of look into all the different aspects from the sort of provenance of technologies and how you might think about it to even um, how you increase the diversity of the people who actually get to develop those technologies as well. And what do you even do with when you work with very marginalized and underserved communities um, to sort of ensure that there is no trade-off for them to be able to use X over Y? Um, because there have been loads and loads of case studies where very novel, innovative technology that is largely untested and could be quite harmful has been imposed onto refugees, for example, because they were literally in a position where they had no other avenue than the support that was already provided. So uh, facial recognition, biometrics in disaster, human, humanitarian and disaster responses, for example, had had a huge impact on and adverse effects on those on those, on those people as well. Um, so I think, yeah, when it comes to why those sort of ethics codes, um, the sort of principles behind technology are good. A, a good shout. There's a there's a there's a friend of mine who um, who teaches at um, one of the UK universities around sort of tech ethics as well, and he wrote a really good blog on around sort of ten um, ten particular technology rules as well. So that could sort of serve as a guiding principle or as a starting point, which includes the sort of um, which includes sort of the readings and more research from social technologists like Kentaro Toyama, who wrote that technology can only amplify existing capacity intent back in 1980 um, and much, much more. So highly recommend and we'll make sure that you can include this in your way. Uh, that makes sense. It's really important because sometimes people start marketing without really understanding what, what is it that makes it even stand out, right? And once you've got this down, so you've got, okay, you understand who you want to target. You understand what makes you stand out to those people. How do you get that message across effectively? How do you reach these people? Definitely. This is where everyone thinks you blow all of your marketing budget and you end up spending all of your money. Um, where is it all going? But there's so many effective ways that you can try and test out and see what works for you from the start. Um, one of, I'll start off with the one that like might be a little bit more costly, but just because I think SEO, you're hearing it, um, or like more and more knowing like the keywords that your company might be utilizing and understanding how that can drive organic traffic and visibility for your company is so important. 
Um, but recently I came across um, Uber Suggest by Neil Patel, who talks a lot about SEO um, and has a free trial for keyword research. So especially if that's something that you've not looked into yet, it could be something to test out um, and understand how your business is portrayed, how you want it to be portrayed and where you rank, how you fit in there as well. But especially at the start, we know marketing budgets can be quite limited to founders. Um, so there are things like educational content that can definitely be used. And it doesn't need to mean that you'll want to write long reports every single month, um, but use your voice and the channels that you have that are readily available. So things like LinkedIn, Slack communities that exist and build your own um, kind of database and your own email database, I think will be key to be able to understand who's interested. It will definitely help support that profile building, but also ensuring that you're getting your message out, to, out there to those that are um, within your funnel. So whether they are like early stages, just learning about your company, the product, the services you offer, or later more towards that conversion side, you can definitely tinker and tailor the messaging that they're receiving. Um, but because it is email, like it, it can be one to kind of test out, um, as well. And on the side of kind of educational content, there has to be a value exchange. I think we, think it's very easy like someone will fill out a form we'll get their details but you need to make sure like why is this compelling enough for someone to want to put their details in and exchange that what will I be giving them in return making sure that there's key and easy takeaways from that as well um, but things that you can definitely utilize and um, and be able to use to promote your organization your products and your services more are things like blogs articles um, or even take part in webinars, host any, um, where you're able to uh, educate potential customers about your product and their industry trends as well. You said where they feel like they have to be aggressive, they have to be strong, otherwise the company won't be successful. And if you look at that from the other perspective, right, of what is being a compassionate leader, what value does that bring to the organization? So especially for founders now who are, they're setting the culture of their team, right? Like, the way that they are as a leader sets the culture of the entire organization. Why does being a compassionate leader mean that they're going to be a better company and more successful in the long run? So I think um, in terms of leaders in general, they have a lot of pressure on them, right? So they usually have to deliver something or they have milestones and goals. So <clears throat> there is a lot of pressure um, on that individual, but it's firstly how you, how you deal with that pressure as an individual and how you try and shield your team, I would say, from that pressure as well. Um, I think um, people can be, I've worked with leaders who have been, I would say, borderline scary <laughs> because they, they take a very aggressive approach to leadership. And the result of that is that people then feel afraid of them. And then you can't really bring up any issues that come along with delivering a certain goal and, you know, expect the unexpected. Nothing goes smoothly. You can plan and plan a plan and sometimes things don't go according to plan. So if you've got quite an aggressive or strong leadership like that, then people in the team are then afraid to actually bring up these, um, these challenges and actually discuss them. Whereas if you have a more compassionate style where you create an environment where you talk about how to achieve those goals together, not the leader, but the team, we're all the same, and create an environment where things can be discussed openly. I think that leads to better team dynamics, more accountability for each of the team members, and helping to achieve those goals as well. We hope you're enjoying the episode so far. We just want to give a quick shout out to our headline partners, HPC Innovation Banking. One of the biggest challenges for so many startups is finding the right bank to support them. Because you might start off and try to use a traditional bank, but they don't understand what you're doing. You're just talking to an AI assistant or you're talking to somebody who doesn't really understand what it is you've been trying to do. HPC have got the team that have built out over years to make sure they understand what you're doing. They've got the deep sector expertise and they can help connect you with the right people to make your dreams come true. So if you want to learn more, check out hbcinnovationbanking.com.
a lot of founders do make a lot of mistakes when trying to build relationships and it can come off as come off as very inauthentic. What are some of the mistakes that people have made with you or you've seen other people make that you think really hinders this, especially from a founder's perspective? I would say that the soft skills are the ones, are the things that are the hardest um, to teach. And I get this constantly within my role because I'm supporting a lot of founders um, and VCs. And so naturally I get inundated with LinkedIn outreaches of people that just want to go for a coffee chat or want to book in time with me or just have something really kind of random and obscure. And I want to be nice and I want to you know, help everyone out there. But the reality is we have a finite amount of time. And for me, I find it quite frustrating, to be honest, when I when I receive these requests. I actually genuinely, I want to help them. But the pitfall is that I actually don't have any background of how I can clearly help them. And you want to make sure that you're, you're utilizing someone's time. So if you're a founder and if you're going out to a partner or someone that you're looking to broker introduction, someone that can help you, be really clear on that ask. And, and also don't be afraid in being direct in a way that, you know, you've done your research and you said, hey, I can see that you've got this experience and you volunteered here or you've done you know, some mentoring in this place and you know this person and why that is valuable for you. Because the power, you can never discredit the power of storytelling. And that's what I've probably learned within my time is that actually those personal experiences, those, you know, um, the learnings and challenges that you've had, it's not actually a bad thing to share those because that builds rapport, builds trust from the other person. It gives them a sense of you and, and why are you actually going to them? Like why are you actually, you know, called out reaching? And so I find that incredibly helpful in the calls and, you know, meetings that I've had with people that have reached out to me, um, you know, called has normally been because of some sort of personal sharing or connection or something that they've, you know, stated in their outreach that, I personally connect with and they've spent the five minutes to go, you know, look through my profile or found that mutual and said, you know, I actually know this person from university or my previous startup would love to connect. And that just goes to your point, you know, the, the person that you just previously spoke to and um, you know, did, did some due diligence, it goes, it goes, you know, a long, long way. Um, so I think that's just the, the only advice. And I think a lot of founders would both, um, you know, heed that advice, but also would, they would also appreciate because I'm sure they get inundated with, you know, outbounds and requests all the time. I almost see relationships in this like mental model of like almost like Venn diagrams in a way. If you imagine like you know, personal, professional, and I mean, personal can be split between family and friends as well. And I have this reminder as well because I have a like a little like um, Trinity, Trinity knot, and it always reminds me of those different concentric relationships that I have. And also like for me, my my family and my friends will always come first. I mean, that's just like a like I think I can call. Um, but then beyond that, when it comes to professional relationships, there is a bit of an overlap. And what I'm finding, especially one of the cultural nuances and differences, actually, I've, I realized moving from Sydney to London was that there is a lot more overlap and interplay between personal and professional. And a lot of the connections that you, you make, it's like once you connect with someone, you message on WhatsApp, you're, you know, you're going to seed runs and different, you know, activities. Like that's when you've actually built not just a, a professional relationship, but a, a personal one. Um, for me, in terms of prioritization, I always think about, I guess I have to go, kind of go through a list of, okay, what are the outcomes that I'm trying to achieve? And is there a mutual win-win? Because to your point, there are so many people that reach out about potential collaborations and events but the reality is I don't want to be wasting their time and they don't want to be essentially wasting my time. So I find it's incredibly valuable to be clear around what is it that realistically you can both achieve. Now, you don't always know that from the get-go and that is part of the, you know, getting to know that person, exploring what opportunities there might be. But for me, I'll prioritize based on that. If there is a clear, um, you know, clear, immediate outcome that we can both drive together, that's going to take my priority. And so I'll always look at it from a work lens, my hat, within leading fintechs and then the VC partnerships lens. So if I can provide value in that and there's something tangible that I can and drive, I will focus my energy there. But then tangentially, if there are, you know, people that have interest or they want to support or they want to learn more, or there's something that, you know, maybe there's some benefit there. I also go, you know, you never know when a, a relationship is going to help out some, sometime down the track. So I always try and pay it forward. And even if it's just, Hey, I can't help you right now. Maybe I'm not the right person but I'm always super open with my network and I'll introduce people and make that connection. So I've done that, you know, a lot within now having worked across you know, different regions, making introductions to people back in Australia, people that are looking to expand and grow the business. I'm super, super happy to, you know, to pay that forward. So 
that's my kind of thought is, again, is that kind of, is that kind of that immediate value and, and just checking with yourself, are you balanced right now? Do you have the capacity? Um, Cause that's something with me. I always say yes to, to a lot of things. And I guess, you know, that's even how we've collaborated in a lot of ways. I've just been super inspired and super taken back um, by what you're doing with the community. And I've gone, yeah, let's do this, let's drive this. But I'm always just checking it, tying it back. Okay. Is there actually an outcome that we can both mutually benefit from and where am I at at the moment in terms of everything else on my plate? So it's look, there's no perfect recipe. Emma. I think we're all just trying our best at the end of the day and just um, trying to do the right thing. Right. So is there any particular areas of like partnerships that you think are often overlooked where startups can really gain a lot of value from, but maybe there's a lot, you don't see too many startups actually trying to create this kind of partnerships. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, another great question. I'd say that um, really leverage the networks and the connections that you have and don't be afraid to ask um, questions. So if we take, for example, in the BHQ event that was done at Google recently, there were so many people that I spoke to that had no idea that funding was available for them. And they had no idea that there was all this support ecosystem that was available, which is essentially the partner ecosystem that we have, right, as entrepreneurs. Uh, so ask those hard questions and um that will get you to the next step. So just, just go and leverage that network and don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel like, oh, am I doing the right thing? Because if you don't take that first step and you don't ask, be risky, um, you won't know. What are some of the great questions that people have asked you at these kind of events? So some of the questions I get, I so some of the questions that I personally get asked are, um, can, how do we get technical support or how do we get funding? Um, I'm doing this uh, with my company. I've got this idea. I don't know operationally how to elevate to the next level. Can, have you got some advice for us? So those are type of types of questions that um, I tend to get asked. You mentioned that you've done this in such a, a lean team and limited budget as well, especially in the early days. And there's going to be many founders listening now in that same position where they've got a small team, they've got limited resources, but they want to make that impact and want to start creating that long lasting legacy. What are some of the steps that people can take at those early days where maybe they don't have 100 million from a VC to prop, prop them up? Yeah, I mean, we're we're proudly bootstrapped, um, independently owned and female founded and bootstrapped to date. Um, and, you know, we've we're. That, I think, has actually been a blessing uh, in a lot of ways because it's meant that we've had to be really, like, nimble and really kind of, like, seek out the diamonds in the rough, as it were, um, in terms of the opportunities for us to kind of grow our awareness and get kind of people to know about us. Um, Ruby, our founder in the early days, will always say she said yes to every opportunity. I think now she'd probably say don't say yes to everything, but that's because of the stage we're at now and needing to be a little bit more kind of uh, streamlined in our choices and not spreading ourselves too thin. But in the early days, it was just say yes to absolutely everything um, so that people can hear about you because you just never know what can come of it. And we're very proud that because of that, a lot of the relationships that we secured in the early days, particularly within, for example, the influencer marketing space, um, we are still, you know, we still have those today. And actually, it's meant that we don't necessarily have to start afresh and pay a lot of the big budgets that a lot of other brands do, because we've loaded that, that we've we've nurtured that relationship from day one. But the other thing we've done, and I'd like to say we're pretty good at, and we're ninjas in entering competitions. So we seek out opportunities and any opportunities there are to win any kind of budget for any kind of competition, we just put ourselves out there. Even if we don't even think we're qualified for it, sometimes we just throw our hats in the ring because we're like, we can do it. We, you know, there's, at the end of the day, you've got to be in it to win it. And what's the worst that can happen? You don't get selected this time round, um, or you know, you, you miss out on that opportunity. But at least you know then what it takes if you want to enter again the next time. What you might need to do in order to kind of have a better chance the next time around. So, 
I can give you two very clear examples of things that we've done. So the Sky um, Net Zero Footprint Fund, um, which launched, I think, three years ago now, we were so we entered in their second year and we were selected as the winners of the, the second the, the second year fund. So we won a quarter of a million pounds to um, create our first ever TV ad, which then got aired across Sky channels uh, throughout 2023. Um and another one was the JC Deco um, Reach program, which was leveraging media, outdoor media, digital outdoor media to speak to kind of uh, minority communities and, and ethnic communities, which we um, won £100,000 for, to, and which we launched our Desi Period Stories campaign around for South Asian Heritage Month last year, which was all about the Wuka wedding and kind of the intergenerational impact of menstruation across the South Asian communities. So... Two very different examples of media formats, um, but, you know, nearly half a million pounds worth of media there that we secured for zero, um, which we would have otherwise never got if we hadn't just kind of thrown our hats in the rings and had a little bit of self-belief. And with people knowing what their options are, if they're trying to consider right now, is IPO I want to go down? Because I think sometimes, often people I talk to, they think about an IPO is post unicorn valuation or something way down the line, how should they maybe consider or think about, maybe I should do this earlier. Maybe there's some which could be maybe in the near term future. Absolutely. And I, and I guess part of the reason for people thinking you need to be a unicorn is there are you know, so many war stories of companies that didn't make it. Look, it's, it's hard. It's clearly not for everyone. And those that get the press are typically you know, those businesses that floated, haven't really delivered and then have gone back cap in hand to fund managers asking for capital. And at some point, people get fed up of funding. And if you looked at venture, you'd see the same horror stories, right? But you know, just to give you some examples, um, in 2017, we had Boku, um, which is Californian uh, fintech that listed here in, in payments. They help you know, Spotify and Netflix subscribers in Indonesia and um, Singapore and Malaysia uh, and really all around the world subscribe to um, the likes of Spotify and, and, and Netflix, and they came to market with just $17 million of revenue. Now, they were backed by the great and good of Venture, Benchmark Index, Kostler, NEA, DAG, A16Z, um, you know, $70 million of revenue, not really growing, loss-making. And you know, they raised £45 million of primary uh, capital at a £126 million market cap. And you know, today, it's about $550 million uh, market cap, right? So 4x. Um, Phonics was founder, um, owned and led a guy called Will Neal. He's backed by 170 uh, fintechs. Uh, so if you need money, go and speak to Will. Um, he, uh, you know, that company is 40 million pounds of revenue, growing about 30 percent, 19 percent EBITDA margin, and you know, that's been a free X on the market. And that was all secondary. So they raised also 45 million, but this capital really went out to, to Will and um, other shareholders to reinvest um, in in the startups they chose. Um, one of my favorite examples um, is a company called Alpha Group. Uh, so this uh, was also a 2017 IPO. It was founded by a guy uh, called Morgan. Um, eight and a half million pounds of revenue, 65% growth, um, doing a couple million of EBITDA, and they raised 30 million of primary, a bit of secondary, 64 million pound market cap. Um, you know, they priced it about two pounds a share, and that's about 23 quid now. It's just entered the FTSE 250. And Morgan owns 13% of it. There's also 100 employee shareholders. You know, I, I would think IPO is the most democratic way to fund startups. And you know, there's so many brilliant uh, you know, Asian businesses in the UK that they might be thinking about succession planning or you know where next. And um, I think they should really think about you know, using the market to, to fund them and you know, not just uh, be put off by what they might have read in the papers. It's been It's been a good year. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.